Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our webinar. We hope once you've heard our speakers this morning that you'll be inspired to think about recruiting refugees into your organizations to improve your talent pool and increase diversity, all of which we know is, is very good for business. Uh, we have five speakers this morning. Colette Morris from Irish Red Cross will open and give us an overview of the refugee situation in Ireland at the moment. Then we'll have Aina Doyle from Arab speaking about the Arab intern program. Rafa Marouf, who will speak about his journey from Syria to Ireland. Katrina McCain, Gissa from Business in the Community and Mia McCarthy from SSE, all speaking about their experiences in employing refugees. And with that, I'll hand over to Colette to start. Oh, I should just say, yes, please, if you have questions, put them into the Q&A, not the, not the chat, and we'll do our best to answer them at the end of the at, at the end of the talks and then uh, the recording will be available afterwards it will be emailed out from engineers ireland and thanks to engineers ireland for hosting the webinar okay colette over to you thank you thanks very much Evit. um hello everybody it's great to see you all today um and thank you very much for including the irish red cross in your webinar um as Evit has said my name is colette morris and i manage migration services for the irish red cross uh, today, I would like to give you an overview of the work we are doing with Program Refugees and to give you some insights into who the people are and where they are. So the Irish Red Cross has a very long history of working to support refugees in Ireland, and that stretch back, stretches back to between 1945 and when we, we resettled over a thousand child refugees from war-torn countries in what was called Operation Shamrock. Between 1949 and 51, the Irish Red Cross provided refuge for about 384 people from the Baltic countries in Castle Island in Cork. From 1956 on, we looked after Hungarian refugees in County Clare and within our own island between 1968 and 71, we dealt with the thousands displaced who sought refuge in army camps south of the Northern Irish border. Some of you, um, I'm not sure how many of you would remember the Vietnamese boat people who made their homes in Dublin in 1979. The Irish Red Cross also cared for them. And in the 1990s, there were Bosnian refugees who stayed in Cherry Orchard Hospital in Dublin. So the Irish Red Cross has been doing this for quite a while. Um, and intense work in this area kicked off again in 2015, when in September of that year, Alan Kurdi from Syria, the little boy, a two-year-old little boy, made headlines after he drowned in the Mediterranean Sea as his family tried to escape Syria on a boat to Europe. A professional migration services team was set up then within the Irish Red Cross. And since 2016, we've been working alongside the Irish government to support its EU commitment under the Irish Refugee Protection Programme. In the midst of a housing crisis then, and obviously now, we've been sourcing housing for programme refugees through the Red Cross Register of Pledges. And that's a frontline system which fronts, promotes and manages public goodwill in the form of offers of accommodation, goods and services. We've been supported frontline in this work by Arab Ireland since 2016 and more recently by Engineers Ireland supporting arrivals from Ukraine. The Irish Red Cross migration team, the work that we do is that we deliver direct assistance to families and single people through professional casework services, offering wraparound services to refugees, promoting engagement with education, employment, the likes of social protection and health services. And migration services in the Irish Red Cross predominantly works with programme refugees and not spontaneous arrivals. Some of the rights of people with international protection, which um, you know, is, is linked to this web webinar today and what we all hope to do, um, means that if you are declared a refugee or a person with refugee protection, some of the rights that you have include the right to get a job without needing a work permit or any other permission. You've got a right to open a business or work in a trade profession. You've got the right to have access to education and training. So we work with people from different cohorts arriving from war situations predominantly now to help them integrate into Ireland. And the aim of all the work we do within our programs is to enable refugees to integrate into Irish society and to achieve their potential. And employment is a hugely important element for successful integration. An important point to note that every cohort we work with is different. They have different requirements 
that they need to help them integrate. They've got, they come with different skills. They have different levels of English capability. They have different levels of vulnerabilities. And that's really, really important. And these differences can impact the ability or desire or readiness to take up work. I'd like to say within the current team, we have um, a Ukrainian caseworker and we also have an Afghan caseworker. And we have a, a, a lovely chap working for us who is an Afghan um, person, but who was living in Ukraine when that recent crisis hit. So the three cohorts of people that the Irish Red Cross currently work with are from Syria, Afghanistan, and of course, Ukraine. Of the Syrian cohort, there's been a total of 2,184 Syrians who've been resettled in, in Ireland, and they've mostly come from Lebanon and Jordan. And I've been on selection missions with the government in both of those countries. And they come in under the Irish Refugee Protection Programme. Red Cross placement um, since the Syrian people started to arrive was predominantly around highly vulnerable families where there was, has been a low take up on, of employment. But we also worked with a cohort of young single males and their take up was really high um, in the areas of education and employment. And one of the presenters today is one of the clients that the Irish Red Cross actually worked with. Um, a recent report, which may be of interest from the Department of Children Equality and Integration, just in August, following a study that the International Organization for Migration conducted, uncovered a lack of fluency in English within the Syrian cohort is seriously impacting their ability to integrate into Irish society. And that in turn has an impact on their ability to access the labor market. The study, which examined experiences of 153 Syrian refugees who arrived here since 2015 up to 2019 pre-COVID, found that the Syrians, despite the fact that they were overwhelm overwhelmingly enthusiastic you know, in their intention to learn English, um, language provisions and support were not able to keep pace with the demands. Um, and that really has had a negative impact on their ability to join the labor, labor market or to access higher or further education courses. Um, the next cohort of people that I'd like to speak about is that um, those who arrived on our shores from Afghanistan back in August last year. Um, the recent figures uh, indicate that the Irish government has granted 532 Afghan citizens with visas or visa wa waivers to travel to Ireland. Um, I was on site with the government when a lot of the people from Afghanistan arrived um, and conducted interviews with those arrivals out in, in Mosni and a number of other Iraqs. And predominantly those people who, who managed to get out of Af Afghanistan came from any clerical positions um, because they would have been working with governments or they would have been in NGO positions. Um, however, following a recent outreach um, to a lot of the Afghan people that we are supporting, at least 40 uh, at a very brief outreach indicated that they would be very open to working in construction um, or to take up any sort of work. And in fact, because a lot of them have been here now for a year, they feel better placed to start working. Um, I have some statistics on the figures who've arrived um, and where they are. We still have Afghan people in Balhadrine, Clane, Mosni, um, and they are reception centers. So we've got people who are settled in communities, but also a high number of, of Afghan arrivals who are still in emergency accommodation. The reason that I make reference to that is because during our work, um, we have found that people who are settled into accommodation are more likely to engage with work. Um, the other cohort that we will all be very aware of um, is the people who've arrived um, from Ukraine since February of this year. Um, some of the UNHCR facts about the numbers displaced there include the fact that the crisis has internally displaced 6.6 .6 million um, people within Ukraine. 6.3 million from Ukraine have been recorded crossing international borders into neighboring countries, such as Poland and Moldova. And approximately 13 million people are estimated to be stranded in affected areas or, or unable to leave due to heightened security risks. As to the situation with Ukraine, um, Ukraine arrivals in Ireland, as of last month, um, the government indicated that 48,000 PPSNs have been issue, issued under the Temporary Protection Directive. 
um, in terms of who the arrivals are from Ukraine. Um, women aged 20 and over accounted for 47% of arrivals to date. Individuals, male and female, from zero to 19 account for 36%. Um, there was a high percentage of those arriving, 38% categorized as one parent with children. Um, and as we all understand, as people were conscripted or remained in Ukraine um, to fight, um, partners, spouses and made adult, adults may have stayed in Ukraine. Um, however, males who conscripted in March of this year may now start to travel to Ireland to join the family. So we may see a shift in the demographics just outlined there. Um, on the 7th of August, 22 of the Ukraine arrivals that attended an employment support event arranged by Intreo, Public Employment Services. 67% of the arrivals at that time were noted with English language proficiency being a challenge in securing employment. And of 15,000 approximately arrivals who attended an Intreo event last month, 11,000 had recorded previous occupations with professionals being the largest group at 33%. Um, of the 11,000 persons where the highest level of education was recorded, 68% had achieved an NFQ level equivalent to seven or higher. Um, so that's kind of an insight into the most recent arrivals from Ukraine into Ireland. So that's a little bit of insight into who um, the Red Cross are predominantly working with um, because they are program refugees, they have a right to work. Um, all of the cohorts are different, but I suppose the question on all our lips is how to find refugees who want to work in engineering or construction. Um, well, the simple response to that is from the Irish Red Cross perspective, we can ask them. Um, as I said, the refugees we work with have the right to work. Um, as I've said also, it's best if they've secured accommodation because if they are in an Iraq or in temporary accommodation, they can be moved. So there isn't security of where they're going to be. And sometimes that can impact somebody's willingness to engage with work. Um, with any individual or family where the Red Cross has provided accommodation and casework, we have records of their previous occupation. And we also, through our engagement, would be able to gauge their willingness to engage in employment. So we can ask them. Um, so for any Ukrainian cohort, for instance, where government has appointed us beneficiaries, we collect in-depth biodata and that covers employment categories. So we can also reach out to those people on your behalf. We also work with other NGOs alongside and in partnership with um, the Irish Refugee Council, their alumni and Mask in Cork. So we have a lot of networks where they are working directly with people who I would gauge be very interested in at this point in their migration journey to Ireland be willing to engage in work in either construction or in engineering services. And we have the network, we have the framework to engage and get those responses for you. So that I hope was a helpful insight into who we're working with uh, and where they are. Um, I can provide much more in-depth information through Edith um, in Arab, if required. Um, and Edith will also be providing you contact details if you wish, wish to get in touch with me or my team. Thank you very much. And back to Edith. Thank you very much, Colette. And unfortunately, Colette has to leave us now, so won't be here for the Q&A. But if there are questions, we can take note of them. And when the recording is sent out, we'll answer the questions at that point in time. So now we'll hand over to Aina Doyle. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I am going to talk to you about um, the work we've done here in Arup um, in setting up a, a programme which aimed to help uh, refugees uh, find work experience in the engineering and built environment sector in the hope of uh, gaining or regaining full-time employment. Um, the aim also of the programme was to allow Arup to widen its talent pool and benefit from, from the skill set, uh, diversity and experience of people from varying backgrounds. 
So the program consisted of a six month internship um, we started in we started in the Dublin office in October 2022 and that role was filled by an intern Rafaea um, from Syria who will talk to you later on um, and he joined the advisory uh, digital services team. So the program itself is heavily reliant on buy-in from the, the existing staff and the team um, which would be around the, the intern and um, in a willingness to provide mentorship um, and knowledge and guidance and thankfully uh, we had that. So the program itself consisted of 50% training and 50% project work. So this allowed them um, the candidate to build on their foot, uh, partake of formal training courses to build on their soft skills and their technical uh, skills will also be part of the project team and learn about local local project work and how things work and also to inter interact with uh, the, the wider art team. So initial outcomes were very positive and um, it was a steep learning curve, but, um, but Rafaela um, was very willing to learn and take on tasks. And it has led to um, Rafaela being taken on as a full time employee with our um, when the program was finished, which is very positive. Um, so, follow on steps, we wanted to build on the success of the program and maintain momentum. So, we set about developing guidelines and processes for mentoring and training. Um, and we created a formal job description to share with relevant parties and to seek uh, uh, seek out uh, relevant relevant uh, candidates for the internship program. So we continued to liaise with uh, the Irish Refugee Council and the Irish Red Cross and business in the community, and um, get the word out there to advertise the program, um, and to identify appropriate candidates for for the division. So currently we have brought on a Ukrainian refugee and uh, they are now working full time in Arab and so that's working out pretty well. So I suppose the main aim of this presentation is that we, we share the knowledge and experience from the program and I hope that um, other, other firms and businesses within the industry um, are take interest and maybe um, seek out to do something similar in the future. Um, so I'm now going to pass over to Rafaela, who's going to talk about his experience and uh, leading up to the programme and in, in, in the programme. Yeah, uh, thanks, uh, Emilia Nina. So thank you all for having me here. My name is Rafa Marouf, um, and I'm from Syria. I will share my um, story of the trip from Syria after the breakout of the war until arriving to the island. I don't think, uh, can you see my screen? No. No, not yet. Sorry. <clears throat> yeah, it's coming up. Okay. The story focuses on one um, aspect. We haven't, I can't see the screen yet, uh, Rafa. No? Okay, just. Uh, uh, oh, okay, the share one. Okay, right. Can you see it now? Yep, yes, thanks. Okay, so uh, the story focuses on one aspect of the war regarding the young men in the age of the mandatory uh, military service. I got the electronic degree in 2016 when I started my studies. I thought um, I was going to have a boring life and maybe work uh, for the government or something like that. But uh, for a reason that you can all imagine and that I will not develop here, um, I was not able to get bored. Because of the situation in Syria, there are no jobs opportunities outside of the military service and I was forced to leave. These two photos there 
show the daily life of Syrians queuing for gas, bread, or normal resources to survive. If you are a lucky young man, you will get your needs after hours of queuing and go back to your family. Have some rest until next day to restart this again. If you are unlucky enough, you will end on another queue under the eyes of the soldiers to be taken to the in front lines, in front lines of the war. No one would like to be on either photo. Thousands of young men have been stopped at the checkpoints, at universities, shops, or streets, and taken to the military service without even saying goodbye to their families. So anyone will try his best to flee from the country. But what options we have? Well, Turkey will be the first mandatory destination for any survival trip. I thought things, things will go simply in Turkey. I would spend a few weeks in Turkey, then I go to Europe through Greece and claim asylum there as many of Syrians did. But no, the situation in Turkey changed dramatically since the failed attempt of the coup in 2016 to be worse and worse for Syrians. I got stuck in Turkey with no status, which meant that life was very difficult as I could not, for example, find any legal job. In Turkey, when you are in this situation, you are constantly under threat to be deported back to Syria. And that happened for many Syrians in 2019 and still happening. It's quite stressful. I spent three years there. However, while there, I worked in small workshops that were giving jobs for Syrians like me, obviously very underpaid and with no security. This is a photo of me in one of those workshops, a belt factory. When I look at me, I know I was so skinny at that time. Although it really was far from my studies and my skills, I learned a lot. I learned about working hard and long hours. I learned how to be mindful of my time. And it also put me with a lot of other people from very various nationalities and social backgrounds. And I liked that. I lost hope in Turkey to continue my journey to Europe after three years and my career as an engineer until 2019, when my brother who lives here got an opportunity when Ireland launched its humanitarian program to apply and bring me here. Finally, I arrived in Dublin in February 2020, after seven years of separation with my families. Some of them leave having left for Germany. Arriving to Dublin was a new start. I didn't want to waste any more time. I was ready to work on my English. With that in mind, I joined a project in DCU, the Meli projects which, have, which my brother recommended for me to improve my language and to make contacts and integrate with the new community, which I can argue about that. This project was about sharing with a DCU partner life stories and experiences. Through text and photographs at DCU, I found nice people to have conversation in English and it gave me the confidence to speak in front of people and making my first new friends in Ireland. Then through the Red Cross, I applied for an internship at Arup. Trying to get a job in Arup was so frightful. It is a big and prestigious company and I have no experience. My English is not good enough. I really was worried about that. But the HR and the finance team were so supportive and helped me through all the difficult administrative the administrative steps, which could have been a nightmare otherwise. Then I met my line manager, who is so flexible and helpful and made things look so much easier than I thought. Through the plan and steps he set up for me, the six months of training and learning went so fast. On top of upskilling, upskilling my engineer skills, 
what I appreciate most was how it taught me transferable skills, such as teamwork, for example. At the end of the six months of the internship, when I was offered a new contract, my first question was for how long this contract took. I could not believe how lucky I was to get a permanent job a little bit over a year in the country and in the middle of the pandemic. I'm finishing this presentation with these two photos because they might abbreviate the whole story. Two parallel lives maybe for the same person under different circumstances. One upset, frowny and hopeless and the other is smiley and full of hope. And I believe that no one will think a minute to take a decision which life he will choose if he can. Thank you for listening. And I will hand over to Katrina. That was an incredible story, Rafael. I'm sure, you know, Everybody was very moved by it. And it's it's just great to hear the voice of the, the person who can benefit from these things and the, and the struggle that you go through and, and the challenges. So I feel like my presentation is going to be very dry in comparison, but hopefully still of interest. Um, so can everybody see now? Let's see. Can you see the screen? Yeah, perfect, Katrina. Thanks very much. Okay, so um, I'm here talking on behalf of Business in the Community Ireland and about the kind of work that we do supporting people into, into employment. And uh, so just a little bit of background information about Business in the Community, because you may not have all heard of us. But the purpose of our organisation is to inspire and enable businesses to bring about a sustainable, low carbon economy and a more inclusive society where everyone thrives. So that's a really broad kind of a, a vision and purpose. Um, we've been working in this area since 2000, so 22 years old at this point. And, and now at this stage, after a long period of growth, we have over 100 of Ireland's largest companies are our members. And they are working both individually and separately on sustainability, but our two big collective actions are around um, the Elevate Pledge, which is the, our inclusive workplace pledge, and also our low carbon pledge. And on these areas, businesses are working together on our two main areas, social inclusion and low carbon. We also have a lot of other businesses that we work with around education and employment. So this is just a little overview of our members. And so you can quickly look and see, is your company a member? Because many people are working in companies that are members of business in the community and they don't necessarily know it. But as you can see, Arup are there and SSE, who you'll be hearing from shortly, are also members. So we've been working just in the area of employment, which is only a part of our work, but we've been supporting different groups facing disadvantages into employment since 2002. So you have a really long history in this area and a lot of expertise. And we work with a number of different groups. Our current programs are the one that I'm gonna talk about most today, which is obviously relevant, which is supporting people who, you know, displaced people who are mainly in the international protection system. So these are asylum seekers and refugees. And Rafa would have been exactly the kind of person we, would, we work with, though he didn't actually come through our program. Um, so that's our EPIC program. We also have an employability program working with people with disabilities, one focused on women who are distanced from the workplace. And most recently, we've started a program to support travellers into employment because they are the most discriminated group within Ireland with the highest level of unemployment at about 80%. So we really, as, an, as a country and as an organization, need to do something about that. Around the, the EPIC program, which we've run since 2008, so again, a really long experience working with vulnerable migrants and refugees. The main bar, I wanted to just talk to you about why we need tailored programs to support uh, uh, refugees and asylum seekers into employment. So I just wanted to give a little overview of the barriers. And I think what Rafa was talking about will make this you know, he, he brought it to life, but primarily, and also Colette was speaking about this language skills. That's a huge barrier 
for people coming to this country if they don't have strong English. And to be honest, that's not something that business in the community can teach people you need. They need to have a reasonable degree of English before they come to us. So it's really important that the that around the country there is good language provision to help people engage with, with, for, with employment and further education. So apart from language skills themselves, it's also the kind of language that we use in the workplace. So that's, that's something that we do work on. Um, a lack of understanding of the Irish job market. All job markets are very different from each other and uh, you know, very culturally different and the actual systems that people use to apply for jobs are very different. So it's really important that we teach people how our job market works and how they can apply for jobs. A big barrier is recognition of qualifications or lack of recognition of qualifications and experience from other countries. So again, this is an area that we support people with. Barriers of what to apply for if you've worked in different kinds of areas in a different environment. You don't even necessarily recognize the kind of jobs that we have here. So it's to help people understand that, how to apply, how to do CVs, how to do interviews. Cultural differences are huge as well. Um, you know, the there's in terms of communication, the Irish, for example, are we are really, really indirect communicators. We very rarely say things as they are, we like to beat around the bush. So other cultures can be a lot more direct about things. And so it can really lead to huge misunderstandings between people. You know, for example, if you ask somebody, you know, oh, are you busy? Um, as a manager, you might you might say that, really expecting them to say, but yes, I'm busy, but can I help you? Um, but somebody coming from a very different and more direct culture will definitely will probably just say, yes, I'm busy. And that's that's it. So it's uh, you know, you can end up having and that's a very small example of the kind of uh, communication differences that we can have. And so we try to help people navigate that and understand a bit more and understand the sort of 17 meanings of the word grand and uh, how to deal with that. Another huge barrier would be, you know, people have come through and Rafa did a wonderful description of what he had been through, kind of stress and trauma and isolation when you arrive here. And having to deal with all of that and the kind of the, the journey itself, not to mention why people leave their countries in the first place. People are dealing with a lot of that and it has a huge impact. Um, and then so that can affect your ability to integrate into the Irish workplace. So the, the EPIC programme is designed very much to try to deal with these things. Um, we have a combination of group training, which is now online since, since the pandemic, which was one of, one of the few good things for us was that it allowed us now to, to reach people throughout the country. And um, that focuses on CVs, interview skills, job applications, LinkedIn, and other hard skills for applying for jobs. We're very uh, involved with businesses who provide a lot of different supports, including IT skills training, a lot of workshops mentoring, mock interviews, and other areas like that. And also just the regular interaction with people in businesses really helps break down barriers. And we see a big increase in the number of our participants who will apply for jobs in the kind of companies that, that are engaged with our programs. Apart from the sort of hard skills, the really important work I think is much more around motivation, helping people recognize their strengths, break down isolation and help them to understand and navigate Irish society. Um, everybody gets in an individual career guidance counsellor assigned. And there's also, we also have a psychosocial support worker to help with other issues. And once people start work, that's one of the hardest times. Those kind of transitions can be really hard. Again, I think Rafa really described how that can be very challenging and frightening. So it was great. Arab obviously had a real wraparound support. It's not every company is going to have that, but we would try to provide a lot of support at that stage to help people integrate. We also work directly with some of our business members to help recruit part participants and, and build a path there. So I just thought I would, I looked back over the, uh, the last year or so uh, of people that we've worked with and just extracted out of people who had engineering related degrees. And you can see that we are actually working with a lot of people with engineering degrees. Now, obviously you need to dig into the detail here and I don't necessarily understand all of these degrees even, but there's, there's a really huge level of, of talent out there. 
So every year we work with about 225 new participants and have people that have been through the program before. Our outcomes are generally very good and 64% uh, of people would progress to implement. That varies a bit year by year, but that's an average since 2017, 64% progressing into employment. Um, sometimes it might take a year between when they've engaged with us first and get into employment, but they get there. And an additional 17% into training and internships and other outcomes. So working with businesses, we that's core, core to what business in the community is about and where we work with them on the employment area and trying to help people, help companies recruit. Um, we would work with the business, talk about the kind of roles that might be suitable, what kind of barriers we might run into and what kind of supports are needed. Work out a plan on how to work together. And then we can either just refer participants for particular roles or there's also the opportunity to do outreach recruitment because we would, we're linked with a lot of other organizations as well. We provide support for people starting in their new roles and also provide advice and support for line managers if they need it, because sometimes issues can come up that they haven't seen before and don't know what to do. And they, you know, so they can talk to us. So I'm going to hand over to Mia from SSE, and she's going to give an example, not specifically to do with working with refugees, but with the kind of joint, joint kind of program that a member company can do with business in the community. So I'm going to hand over now. Um, yes, you'll get my contact details afterwards. So Mia, I'm going to hand over to you and stop sharing now. Thank you, Katrina. Just to bring up my um, slides. And um, hopefully you can all see that. So. Oh, yeah. So I just wanted to, I suppose, first of all, echo Katrina's comments. Um, Rafia, thanks very much for your personal story. I think it's really important in terms of when we talk about any of these projects um, or initiatives that, you know, sometimes we kind of have labels for groups and we don't think about the individual at the end of that. And I think it's really important to hear that individual story. So thank you very much for sharing that. Um, I suppose just to introduce myself, my name is Mia Fahim McCarthy and I'm Head of Sustainability for SSE in Ireland. So covering off the jurisdictions of the Republic of Ireland and Northern Ireland. And in terms of SSC, we are leading generator of renewable um, electricity and one of the largest electricity network companies in the UK. And we also develop, own and operate um, low carbon infrastructure. So the likes of um, offshore and onshore wind farms, hydropower, electricity transmission, distribution grids and efficient gas fire generation as well. We have over 10,000 employees, um, and I suppose, as a lot of companies say, but in our case, we really do, sustainability is very much embedded in all that we do. So it's tied into our business strategy as well. We don't have a separate sustainability strategy and a separate business strategy. The two are very much aligned and intertwined, and um, so much so that we would use the UN Sustainable Development Goals as a framework within our business strategy. And one of those goals, which I suppose is the most pertinent to today's conversation, would be goal eight, decent work and economic growth um, in terms of kind of the, the projects that we would have worked on. So I'll just um, take you to two of them, which are our SSE Works Programme and our Knowledge Sharing Programme. Um, so just in terms of SSE Works, so we began that programme back in 2017 and a little bit like Aina was speaking about earlier, they seem to be very much kind of in the where we were in 2017 in terms of the kind of the framework and, and putting a framework, I suppose, on, on an initiative. So when we began, we worked very closely with business in the community and a lot of the, the piece of the work that Katrina has outlined there. And we had five people that joined the company in a very structured way um, on a six month program in our SSE electricity side of our business, which a lot of you may know in terms of it being our front facing part of the business where we supply electricity to domestic customers as well as business customers. And um, so we would have had the supports of business in the community. They would have identified people that would have been experiencing um, obstacles to entering the workplace and barriers to entering the workplace previously. And they would have worked with them before they would have ever come to our door in terms of providing with the support around kind of getting their CVs ready and getting work ready in general. Um, and also if there was any issues along the way that they needed extra supports with, they would have provided that. And they would have also let us know about that in terms of the candidates coming through. 
we would, I suppose, hold um, a kind of an open recruitment process and there would have been various kind of um, bars that would be set that people would need to achieve in order to, to gain employment with us. And we were very conscious that with people who had been out of employment for some period of time, we couldn't necessarily set the same standards. We needed to not necessarily lower the standards, but we needed to adjust the standards in order to ensure that people got a fair, a fair chance at being able to, co to come and join us. Um, so the whole recruitment process was modified um, in terms of that. Um, so with the support of business of the community and us being able to modify our own processes, we were able to bring people on, on board. And then the team leaders that would have worked with those five participants would have also been very engaged in the process. So where there may have been uh, ways of working that they would have had with other um, employees, they would again be slightly modified in order to be able to support those participants as best they could. And um, so those five candidates came on and in the initial stages, it was very much a pilot program with the view to give people six months, I suppose, experience within a workplace. Because it was so successful the first time round, when we went to do the second iteration of the program, we decided that actually we should be able to offer people full time employment at the end if they were able to meet kind of the the various, I suppose, kind of um, probation pieces that they need to meet along with any other employee. And um, so when we did it the second time, rather than it just being a six month placement, it was actually with a view to full time employment. And again, that was really successful. And I suppose each iteration as we've gone through from 2017 to now, we, we've always looked at kind of what are the needs of the participants coming through? How can we adjust and adapt? And also listening to the experience of business in the community in terms of them knowing the candidates so well. And I think as well in terms of the participants that came through in the first cohort uh, versus now, we've also seen shift societal shifts in terms of where where the greatest needs are or where the participants the the majority of participants are coming from where their backgrounds so we've also seen a change in participants so over the course of 2017 to now we've had over 20 candidates and i suppose a really good sign of how the the program has been so successful is that out of those 20 candidates 14 are still with us within, within the business and some of them have moved on to other roles within the organization um, two of them just left in the last year and then others would have maybe dropped out at the very early stages because I suppose as well you have to recognise that if somebody hasn't been in a workplace and they come in it can be quite overwhelming regardless of all the supports that are in place and it may not just be the right time in their lives for them at that stage but I think in terms of the numbers having 14 who are still with us and two that only left in the last year it shows that when you put that wraparound service around people you know you're not setting them up to fail from the very beginning you're setting them up to succeed. Um, so in terms of as well from a business perspective, because I suppose a lot of people on the call will be maybe in companies and wondering, is this something they should do? You know, within the part of the business where participants would have been coming in initially, we would have, um, I suppose, kind of high turnover generally of employees. And in terms of the ret retention rates, you know, they were they were really high compared to maybe what the average um, person applying for a job might be. So there's a benefit to the business in terms of those high retention rates. Um, and then the diversity of the candidates that come through as well. I think we all know and we all hear all the time about how diversity is definitely a bonus to a company. But I suppose it's, you know, kind of in the seeing is believing in terms of what people bring in. They bring in new ways of thinking, new approaches, um, and that can only be a good thing for a company. So I think it's fair to say in terms of SSE Works, it has definitely been a success. There's been challenges along the way, and I suppose as well for team leaders who are working closely with the participants, it has been an added layer to the work that they do. But most of them would say that it has provided them with these new skills that they wouldn't have necessarily been able to achieve or gain had they not been part of, of the SSE Works program. Uh, so that's just about that side of things. And then the knowledge sharing program is a program that we worked on when there was a little bit of a hiatus, I suppose, in terms of COVID, um, when we weren't able to go through with the SSC works for a period, but that now is back on stream, and we wanted to still be able to continue to do something in that space. Um, so again, with business in the community, we worked with them um, in terms of identifying women that would be good for, for the program, and they predominantly came through their EPIC program that Katrina had spoken about earlier. So the focus was on women. They were from migrant backgrounds. So we had participants from the likes of Brazil and India, all highly, 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 I can't stress it enough how highly qualified these women were. And the real shame of it was that they were now working in uh, roles that weren't where they had, um, I suppose, where they have the experience and the qualifications. So they were working in 
predominantly caring roles or in um, service industry, whereas their backgrounds would be as mechanical engineers, civil engineers, a lot, a lot of different types of engineering qualifications that they would have held. And in their countries of origin, they also would have worked in, for example, as grid operators and power plants. And so they had such a wealth of experience. Um, and so the idea of the program was that we would run it over six weeks. And I had colleagues from across the business that would come and speak on each of the sessions on a different topic. So it was to give people, I suppose, the context of the energy sector within Ireland, given that they may have had experience in another country. And um, it was to allow them to gain that little bit more experience. So we had sessions on, for example, biodiversity. We had somebody speaking who was a grid operator in one of our thermal plants. We had somebody who was a um, wind farm operator speaking about her role and what that involved. We had somebody from policy speaking about the um, I suppose energy policy in Ireland. Um, so giving them a flavour of all of those different types of things with, a, with the, um, the thinking that in order for them to be able to go and apply for jobs, having that extra bit of knowledge would hopefully help them um, overcome some of those barriers that they were experiencing. And so over the six weeks, I suppose, again, if we take it back to kind of what does the business get out of it in terms of those colleagues that were speaking, again, that was something that would be outside of their normal day to day role. And it gave them an opportunity to kind of stretch themselves a little bit and do something that they, in terms of the feedback, all found really valuable and really um, interesting to be involved in. Um, so we did that for the six weeks and we also had HR come in on one of the sessions to be able to talk them to them about their CVs. They were offered the opportunity for any of the participants to send their CVs to our colleague in HR who would review them. And if there was any changes or amendments they felt might be needed, they gave that feedback to the participants as well. And um, also to say that we had engineers Ireland on board and they came on for one of the sessions too. And I suppose some of their conversations were with these women around um, looking to see how they can transfer the qualifications that they had in their country, country of origin, how they would be able to transfer them in Ireland so that if a recruiter is looking, they would be able to kind of easily identify what level the person was at. Because for some people, I suppose they feel they go into a pile, the no pile, because maybe recruiters say, I don't have time to kind of, you know, go and research where this university is. Is it reputable? Is this degree legitimate? All of those things. So Engineers Ireland were able to give really good advice on that. And also offer them, um, I suppose, signposting to various networks that they could get involved with here as well to establish themselves. So I think between between all of the, um, the different pieces of information we were able to give to the women, although it was only six over six weeks, you know, it's not going to ultimately change your life in any amazing way. It was a little bit of support, I suppose, in terms of being able to help them. The feedback from business in the community was that for the women did go on to get roles in areas that were much more aligned to what they had studied in and what they had worked in. We can't say that, you know, that's down to us in any way, but it, hopefully that it gave them a little bit of confidence, I suppose, in terms of going forward for any roles. Um, so I think overall, again, just being able to provide a, a service to people where from a company perspective, there isn't that much involved you know it's people just sharing what they do on a day-to-day -day basis sharing the knowledge that they've built up and being able to um give that over to somebody else who can hopefully use it in a, a really meaningful way um, and i think again it was that collaboration piece in terms of being able to work with business in the community who we have a very strong relationship with anyway and also then with engineers ireland as well so bringing in the various stakeholders who have knowledge and experience in different areas and like I see in terms of the benefit to the co two colleagues and for myself personally, it was, um, I suppose, um, something that I was involved in that I found really beneficial and really enjoyable too. Um, so there are just, I suppose, two, two programs that we would have run within SSC. Um, like I say, the SSC works has gone from strength to strength from 2017 to now. The knowledge sharing program, I would hope that we would be able to do another iteration of that fairly soon. Um, and I would encourage any companies that have any scope um, to be to, to do something like this because it doesn't take much time it doesn't take much resources it, financially it doesn't cost anything and yet the benefits that you get back far, far outweigh anything that you'll put into it so I would definitely encourage that and, and if anybody has any questions feel free yeah, feel free to put them into the Q&A and, and I'll just hand back over to Edith thank you very much great Thank you very much, everyone. Thanks to uh, Colette, Aina, Rafa, 
Katrina and Mia. Um, I think in terms of the Q&A so far, uh, Rafa, the main thing that's there is people thanking you for sharing your story and, and noting how powerful a story it is. Um, if people do have some questions, maybe raise your hand or put something into the chat, but I might just um, I kick off by, I, I was interested me in what you said about, um, you know, creating, creating roles or, or changing job descriptions. And I think that's something we saw in Arab as well, that what we were saying was we have had people apply for standard roles that we have out there and 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 be successful, but in a way we created a, a role and that was the point of the internship to create a role, you know, fund 50% of the time through our, our learning and development budgets and through Arab Trust and then fund the other 50% through the projects and just see where it led. But could you say a little bit more about maybe how, how you might have changed your standard job description so that that um people you know refugees and could could apply or could you know that they could feel that they were capable of applying and doing the the role yeah i suppose in terms of it was kind of broader than one one cohort of people but in terms of it being open to people anybody who feels they're experiencing those kind of barriers to entering the workplace and i think it was for us to kind of look at what it was we were asking people initially and I know a lot of companies have come out recently even in terms of kind of you know the the traditional piece around kind of asking people for you know a third level degree or you know various things that when we st when we stop and think about it we kind of say to ourselves well why are we asking this like is is there actually a rationale will it actually help us get the right candidate so it's being able to look at your processes and say are some of them slightly outdated and outmoded you know do we need to kind of reflect the changes in society now um, in order to be able to kind of make our, our workforce and make, yeah, make it more diverse in terms of kind of the so, social mobility piece as well. So I think it's, you know, for like, I'm not, I don't sit in HR, so it's easy for me to, to say these things, but I think in terms of kind of the discussions that I've had with them and we've gone back and forth, and I think then as well, having the support of that outside organization with the likes of business in the community who've kind of been working at this for years, it's being able to kind of get a steer from them too. and with all of that you know then then you can make those changes and I think it's to be realistic too to be able to start with kind of small pieces so you know when somebody is talking about this it's not that you have to go out in the morning and kind of you know scrap and wipe whatever it is you've done up until this point but just being able to first of all maybe re do a review and if there's things that stand out for you that you think actually we don't need to be asking this anymore you know look at those changes and then bit by bit you can kind of work on on making the the whole process more inclusive I think one of the things for us as well is, although we have this structured program of the five people that come into the SSE works, because it's worked so well over time, um, we have kind of, I suppose, built up that pipeline now with business in the community. So if they see candidates coming through that might need those kind of um, the, the kind of hand holding approach and the, the supports, the wraparound supports, they, they will just send through their CV and, you know, it'll go through the process like with anybody else. So we have lots of people that have been employed, but not necessarily within the structured program. So it's being able to open up those avenues of communication. And again, that's a benefit to the business because where they're struggling, maybe in some roles to be able to recruit people here and now they have a whole pool of candidates that they can uh, effectively kind of reach. So, you know, it's, it's a win-win on all sides. Great. Thanks so very I much, Mia. Briefly about this, because job descriptions, they're, they're a bit of a, a, a pet peeve on our side of the house, because uh, so many job descriptions are really, really hard to understand for, uh, for people applying for them. And that's, I think, not just necessarily for um, people coming from other countries. I think that uh, people in Ireland coming from different backgrounds as well will also struggle. And Whereas at more senior levels, you may be really using your job description to filter people out and to be really targeting the people that you want. And if they don't understand the job description, they're not going to understand the job. Have a look at your entry level role descriptions and really, really look at them. And one of the services that we've provided to companies is to get like um, a focus group of our participants to, to look at the job description and provide feedback. And you would be amazed at the misunderstandings that people have and how off-putting um, the job descriptions can be to the point where people just won't apply so you know it's it, it really it, it's an important area to look at and it's so easy to just keep rolling out the same thing but it's really really such an important part especially for companies that are struggling to recruit have a look at your job descriptions so 
that's my, my okay. five cents on that. Thank you. <laughs> okay, going back to the Q and A, we have. Um, Amara Zouz, a good, a good friend of Arab and also a Syrian refugee who has sent in a, a question. What are the speakers' reflection on reaching out to or connecting different organizations together, especially the ones who are doing little in this space, yet they might be interested? And thanks a lot for the great presentation. So, um, Katrina, might that be one for you as well, just to, to start with in terms of that whole thing about reaching out and connecting to other other organizations yeah i mean I, yes it's something that we do a lot in business in the community obviously we have our business network so there's a lot of communication there but also all of our programs we we do a lot of outreach to two other organizations i mean the irish red cross would be one and uh, you know the refugee council and many other organizations around the country um but i think still i would say that there there's quite a you know it's there's quite a scattered uh, or non-aligned uh, level of services out there for, for different people and, and how you hear about things, it's, it's a little bit random. Um, so I do think that there, there's more work that we can do, not just business in the community, on, you know, but on the business side and on the NGO side in terms of being a bit more accessible and more clear. And um, I saw another question in the Q&A there, how do you get in touch with Epic? Um, so obviously you can my my details will be shared, but we have also you know, we have the business and the community website or an email address. Epic. Uh, oh well, anyway, we'll send we'll share this around. But uh, it's yeah, we're very accessible if you know where to look, which is the problem. <laughs> yeah, I think and on that thing about connecting people i think that was part of of you know what spurred on this webinar we we felt you know we had a very bottom up approach and maybe the sse and business in the community is a more structured approach but we were very keen to share that experience so that others might might think about how they might do something within their own organizations either at a small scale or at a big scale and i think that's the thing it probably doesn't have to be at a at a scale, you know, an individual can can make a big a big difference. Um, Aina or Rafa, would you have any any thoughts on that about you know how you could reach out? And I know you've good links with DCU, Rafa, and and various other people as well that um, maybe people could reach out to if they were looking to engage with candidates. Uh, yeah, I mean, I mean, it's it's always uh, you know, it's always about just just throwing out the feelers and, and, and sending emails around but I, I feel you know if, if there's people in, in these organizations who have an interest um in in this type of thing it, it is quite easy to to kind of get feedback and, and kind of get somewhere um but it really is about persistence and kind of keep people on the door um, Rafa, any any last comments from you? Oh, Kalesh has returned to us as well. I don't think I can add more than sharing contacts and emails and any website could be like make a good communication between organization. We can't share any. I mean, I, I can't share DCU, the media projects, it's still on. So that will be a link. Great. Thank you very much. Well, we've we've come to the close of an hour. It seems to have gone by very quickly. So I'll just once again, thank all of our speakers from this morning, as I say, hope that we have inspired some of, of the audience to think about uh, reaching out to employ refugees within their own organization. And thanks very much to Neve Wafer from Engineers Ireland, who's been in the background, facilitating all of this for us, and we'll send out the recording. And we'll we'll send Neve as well all these various contact details that hopefully you will be able to move forward with. Thank you, everyone. Thank, Thank you, Amelia. Bye. Bye. Have a good day. Bye. Bye.